Hello. Thank you, everyone. If it's okay with everybody, just to be on point with the schedule, we will be beginning now with the session. So I welcome you uh, and thank you everyone for being here today to this special joint panel with the Mexi Mexican International Studies Association and the Asian Political and International Studies Association. Today we will be talking about a very important topic which will be the regional security in the face of the pandemic. And I thank uh, all of the people that will be presenting the day today. So just to remind everyone that they will have 15 minutes to talk about their topic. And after that, we can have some uh, questions from the public or anything else that you want to add on the topic. So to start today, we'll be presenting to our first uh, person to be presented today will be the Dr. Alejandro Chanona. Alejandro Chanona is the professor of the Faculty of Political and Social Sciences of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where he is the director of the research project, the regionalism and the challenges of the complex security and defense threats he is uh, the former president of the Mexican International Studies Association from January 2003 to December 2004, and was the founder and director of the Center of European Studies of the UNAM between 2003 and 2006. Professor Chanona received his PhD in government, his master at the Western European Political Studies from the University of Access, England, and his bachelor degree in international relations from the uh, Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. He is member of the uh, Mexico's National System of Researchers, SNE, and he's level two. He has been the director of several research projects focused on regionalism and security among them. The challenges of the regionalism facing the new agenda of international security, the regional models of energy, security, and sustainable development, the comparative debate and debating development models and human security. Dr. Chanana has also been participating on the, on the research associate in the European Union Garnet research projects in the, uh, the external image of the EE and global and regional security governance security threats, and institutional response. Professor Chanona has also participated as a speaker in a wide number of forums, courses, conferences, and roundtables in national and international institutions. He has been the guest speaker in the Center for Superior Novel Studies, CESNAP, and in the Superior War College. He has published 11 books as an author and coordinator 45 book chapters and various articles in distinguished academic journals, as well as research reports. His most recent book in Spanish is a deconstruction and theoretical construction of the European Union, a critical vision. He is member of the Mexican Academy of International Law of the International Studies Association, ISA, and the World International Studies Committee. The Associate of the Mexican Council of International Affairs, COMEXI, a member of the Honorary Council of the Mexican Association of International Studies, AME. Thank you, Dr. Chanona, if you're ready to start. Thank you. Do I have you? a presentation for us too? Yeah, thank you for, for the invitation. Thank you for the initiative of the AME to join exchanges of opinions and uh, rich debate with our colleagues in the Asian International Political Association. Indeed, I uh, intend to, to use my time to uh, reflect upon the main topic we were invited to, regionalism facing the challenge of the COVID-19. And I intend to reflect during my time in relation to a broad picture of the impact of the COVID-19 in regionalisms, uh, some highlights in relation to human security and, and of course the sanitary crisis, the impact of the sanitary crisis uh, in, 
in, in a broad picture too, uh, in relation to the European Union and Latin America and the Caribbean, and share with you uh, what I believe so, are some of my thesis about what is the impact of the Sorry, Dr. Chenana, your microphone is up. Am I, I am I back? Yes, thank you. Did you get my introduction? Just okay. a few seconds, we lost you. Okay, I'm back. Okay, thank you very much for, for the call. Uh, as I said, the regions and the regionalisms in, in the contemporary world are the vital space for the production and survival of the nation state. In different spheres of international life, uh, these regionalisms are consolidated in the face of the failure of major international arrangements. Uh, indeed, um, they are built uh, from the 60s, uh, from the 50s and 60s, uh, these contemporary regionalisms, and they have been a national space for, for the achievements of, of, of the national interests of, of states beyond of geographical determinisms, since they are social constructions driven and institutionalized by the clear political interest of the nation states and their ruling the elites. Um, facing a clear trend where, we, where most of the states are more vulnerable every time to the impact of globalizations, the construction of regionalisms have gone deeper as a response to these challenges. And thus, during the 90s, the, the impulse of the processes of international integration was given a natural element of economic liberalism of the time, with the opening of markets and the construction of regional blocks in a world that is tending to economic multipolarism. Hand in hand with these expressions of diversity of the experiences of the regionalism were strengthened uh, or developed in which countless issues were integrated based on the interests of the member states. Uh, nevertheless, at this conjuncture, the regionalisms are not exempt to be on crisis. What is, what is uh, largely due to, well, that's a, that's a question that I posed. It, well, to, to a time in where the crisis of the global governance leaves regionalisms to a drift. And particularly nation states in unilateral measures in a context where nationalisms, where nationalisms are, are, are rising. Uh, in fact, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has uh, uh, made uh, visible a world that is increasingly more uncertain and unsafe. It has shown trends that, all, that although some of them were already being drawn, they have been confirmed from the geopolitics of vaccines. Um, economic nationalism have characterized uh, in the last decade, the political behavior of many countries um, from world powers to countries with average income or in process of development. It calls the attention, the fact that the face of a global pandemic that would need multilateral responses, these are scarcely regional and very markedly, and this is very important, I, I underline this, they have been very national and local. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the sanitary nationalism. I have to call it like that. Well, at the same time, the pandemic has made visible the great economic, scientific, and technological gaps between members of the international system. It has exposed gaps between countries and regions, also exposing existing distances between members of the regional integration processes. In this way, the sanitary crisis has exposed the limits and weaknesses of regionalisms in a process of attributions, of attrition, sorry, and questioning that is not new, but that has been nesting 
hand in hand with the own system crisis. In fact, we can say that the that reuse are going through multi-dimensional crises that are making them more vulnerable and less likely to international cooperation. Thus, for example, in the case of the European Union, the question have gone from critics uh, to the very structure of the union, governance, uh, capacities to face the, the pandemic at the very beginning. And of course, it's representativeness and democratization. Let us think in the failed attempt of the constitution at the beginning of the 2000s, until high point uh, from the coverage of the crisis, the, the way it has been handled by, by, by the commission and by, by, by the European Council itself, which we can refer as a to we can refer to as a multidimensional crisis. What what that what does that entail? The 2000 economic and financial crisis and its social effects, a refugee and migrants crisis that led to the unilateral closing of borders that exacerbated nationalisms, the impact of the terrorist attacks, and the debates, of course, about the Muslim communities, or, or maybe let's be more proper, Muslim uh, radical, uh, I, would, I would say, militants of corner and radicalization uh, in many ways of all the sectors of the, uh, within the, 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 the European community, not only among the Muslim communities. And of course, uh, I, would, I would point the European social model crisis. Well, um, I would uh, I would say a few words about Latin America in the sense that uh, the capacity of, of Latin America uh, have been lowered, to say the, the least. And of course, uh, as you may imagine, uh, the, the pandemic has made it more visible uh, how inequality in, in the continent uh, has spread in the sense that although Latin America is not the poorer continent, it's the more unequal continent in terms of income distribution. And also, although Latin America has around 10% of the world population, it, has, it, it produces around the 35% of criminal violence in the world. And therefore, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what are the chances of the regional governance of the real governance in front of the, of, of the crisis? We can maybe go deeper uh, in, in the round of questions. In the form of this multidimensional crisis, uh, let me propose five theses for the debate. First of all, since the 90s, we, can, we, 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 we saw the, the, the birth, or, or let's say the rebirth of an emergence and consolidation of diverse regionalisms around the world, driven by the, speci the specific moment of the international system with a diversity of topics, agendas, and institutional levels. These regionalisms emerge as references of the international system at the end of the 20th century. Second, in the 21st century, the regional integration processes are also Processes also became strategic places so that states could attend their security issues. The transnational character of the threats and its own characteristics created the necessity to act in, 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 in a joint initiative, jointly as a regional level. Third, the convergence of the crisis in the framework of the neoliberal globalization, the the very question, the, the, the question of, sorry, results of the economic liberalisms in, in a matter of welfare and human rights have led to the questioning of the globalization itself, context in which the value and effectiveness of regional integration processes are being also questioned, hand in hand with the rise of radical nationalisms and, and xenophobic expressions, the accent is also marked in the disadvantages and the vulnerabilities generated by regionalisms. And they, they may be applied more or less in the case um, of, 
the EU and Latin America and the Caribbean. Fourth, in the framework of the, sanity, of the sanitary crisis, regionalisms have uh, been clearly overtaken. It is re revealed the absence of solidarity, this is very important, and a sense of unity in the face of adversity, since the responses have been fundamentally national and local, as I sustained from the very beginning. In the case of the EU, the lesson has been clear. Once again, the initial response has been to carry out extraordinary measures of national nature, and only afterwards, measures started to be developed within the community framework. In the case of Latin America, the picture is more complex, and I would say it has, they have tried to articulate some mobilization of resources and to establish specific mechanisms of cooperation, but so far this has been uh, not a, a, successful, a successful history. If, if, however, in an international context that is characterized by the convergence of crisis and uncertainty, considering the transnational characteristics of the phenomena that, that put in danger the humanity, like climate change, a natural disaster, uh, the, pandem the pandemic itself, um, arms race, threats coming from organized transnational crime, and terrorism, the regionalisms, I may sustain, recover anyway their validity uh, as an option. If in the context, the values, principles, and interests are shared, I, I mean, in the context of a region, if there is an interdependence, if social dynamics aim at mutual recognition, and if in the framework of regionalisms, it is easier to achieve agreements and operate them, why not? Then the regionalisms will be, and will continue, this is my, my, my vision, part of the answer when facing these challenges. In addition, we must insist that they require international cooperation in order to operate them. Let me conclude in a, in a short way. The EU, of course, has more resources and regional mechanisms to combat the, the pandemic, whereas Latin America and the Caribbean have shown much less resources and regional initiatives to face the pandemic. Let's see how regionalisms may, let's put it this way, reinvert themselves in front of what is visible uh, thanks to the pandemic, and of course, to overtake the pandemic itself. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, doctor. You are very much in time. So we will be heading away with our next participant, which is Yadira Galvez Salvador. She will be talking about Latin America's security challenges and the increasing participation of armed forces in international security. She, uh, Yadira Galvez Salvador, she is a full-time associate professor at the Center for International Relations of the Political and Social Sciences School of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She is academic coordinator of the research project, Regionalisms and the Challenges and the Complexity of Threats Against Contemporary Security and Defense by UNAM, Vice President of the Mexican International Studies Association, a member of the Mexican Think Tank, Collective of Security Analysis with Democracy, CACEDE. She has a PhD in Social and Political Science, Master in International Relations Studies, and Bachelor in International Relations, all by UNAM. She has completed specialized studies regarding security and defense at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies of the National Defense University in Washington, the United States at the Rey Juan Carlos University in Madrid, Spain, and in the program of the Frederick Ebert Foundation in New York for Young People First Fall Academy. Dr. Galvez has lectured and delivered conferences 
at the Center for Higher Naval Studies, CESNAF, the Mexican Institute for National and Strategic Security and Defense Studies, IMEDEN, the Graduate Association of the National Defense School, and at the Federal Police in Mexico. At the same time, she has participated in high-level international seminars and task groups such as the Raisina Dialogue in New Delhi in 2019 and 2020, and on the workshop of Transnational Organized Crime by the International Defense College in November 2020. She also participates as associate researcher for the Center for Studies on Transnational Organized Crime of the International Relations Institute of the Universidad de la Plata, Argentina. And she is also part of the network of international experts of the Center for Strategic Studies of the Army of Peru. She is an international affairs analyst in several media, CNN in Espanol, Fora TV, and America's Dial Digital Military Magazine, among others. Her most recent publication is Estados Unidos, Está de Regreso, Cambios y Continuidades en Política Exterior, Seguridad y Defensa en el Gobierno de Biden. Foreign Affairs Latin America, in its digital version for 2021. And please, please, uh, Dr. Yadira Galvez, please, if you want to start. Thank you very much, Mara, for your kind presentation. I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And first of all, I would like to say that it's it's a pleasure for me being here, sharing this round table with my colleagues. And of course, thank you very much to the Mexican International Studies Association and to our partner association, the Asian Political and International Studies Association. Well, I'm gonna talk about the Latin America security challenges and increasing participation of armed forces in internal security. This is part of our research project, Regionalism in the face of the challenge to contemporary security and defense, phase two. And I'm gonna to start to say that um, due to the um, emergence of new transnational and non-conventional threats to security and defense, the role of armed forces has changed beyond its traditional roles and missions in defense policy. Our research analyzes how this process has been happened in Latin America and how the use of the military against security threats has meant to come back to the logic to internal security and defense issues where the boundary with public safety has been gradually broad. That is especially important in countries like Mexico. In Latin America, there is a clear return of armed forces to internal activities. The new roles, new roles and missions, including confronting organized crime, support in cases of natural disasters, their participation in security for major events and other missions. The current, in the current international context and due to the raising of new transnational and non-conventional security threats all around the world, the armed force missions have expanded into unconventional areas and also their doctrines and strategies are being Redefined. This has included its incorporation in a broad kind of activities supporting civilian authorities like operations against terrorism and organized crime groups, including illicit trafficking of people, arms, narcotics, or cultural goods. Another area that has taken impulse in recent years is the support of the military in sector like a natural disaster management. And of course, we have witnessed the role that the military has been playing in the context of the global health crisis, including its support in a broad range of duties like policing during the lockdowns, logistical support for, for the transfer of medical supplies 
and including this including Bacan's or Halkai's sauces. According to Ismela, the non-traditional missions of the armed forces include those deployed in support of internal security, the use of non-lethal force, small scale operations with like weaponry, and those that involve a great deal of civil military interaction. The idea of the military transformation rests precisely on the goal of harmonizing military capabilities to threats. Following Scott, Scott Jasper analysis, this means moving from single threat, this is the state of state or simple war, to complex crisis response scenarios. From traditional nation state threats to focusing on the centralized network of non-state actor, from conventional combat to multiple irregular and asymmetric operations, and also from external defense to security activities, whether internal or in the framework of international missions, like for example peace operations in the framework of United Nations. This is clear that the enlargement of military tasks to non-conventional areas is not an exclusively issue in Latin America. However, the problem in our region is directly related to the historical trajectory of military power, its participation in coups, the preservations of military prerogatives after the transitions to democracy, to democracy in the 80s, and then nowadays concerns about the deepening in the military side's response to security challenges. The end of the Cold War and the democratic transitions process in Latin America open up the possibility of rethinking and reconfiguring the regional security agenda with a special focus on issues as the adoption of the multidimensional concept of security, the redefinition of the military missions, and of course, the agenda of civil military relations in a, in a democratic context. However, the military continue to perform internal security activity in all regions, in countries such as Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, for example, for decades, the military has been participating in missions against drug trafficking and a range of actions related to internal order. At the hemispheric level, we can identify this tendency analyzing the commitments in the framework of the summits of defense ministers of the Americas and in these declarations. This trajectory has continued to deepen and deepen, resulting in a kind of path dependency. Considering the region trajectory over the past two years, we can outline five trends that will be present in Latin America's post-pandemic security agenda. First, the strengthening of transnational organized crime networks, with a probably increase in criminal violence as a result of the confrontations of these groups for rules and sons of operation. There are many alarms about the expansions of Mexican criminal organizations operations toward Central and South America. Over the last few years, we have seen the expansions of criminal violence in the region. Killings in Costa Rica, the recent jail crisis in Ecuador, the violence on the border between Venezuela, Brazil, and Colombia, but also the alarm bells has been raining in countries like Chile. Just as an additional fact, we must remember that even in the last year lockdown, criminal violence has not been reduced in Mexico. This is not a new phenomenon. Let's remember that in Guatemala has been the zone for, of the expansion and confrontation of Mexican organizations has a collateral effect 
of the Merida Initiative and Plan Colombia. Second, the adaptation and expansion of organized crime groups, including areas such as illegal mining in the Amazonian area, environmental crime, human trafficking and smuggling, and of course, arms trafficking. In the context of the COVID-19 crisis, it has also involved medical supplies and their control footing. Third, following the same logic, we see a greater cooperation, cooperation of these groups through cyberspace. Therefore, cybercrime in all these dimensions will continue to rise. Following the same logic, we see a greater operation of these groups through cyber. Four, the social impacts of the health and economic crisis will be even more strongly felt in the region. The migration crisis will continue and probably will deepen. But we can also expect greater political and social crisis. These will be linked to corruption scandals, impunity and state fragility. And finally, five, the relationship with the United States is being redefined under the Biden administration. Everything points to the fact that cooperation programs will tend to strengthen the instruments of cooperations like diplomacy and development, placing special interest in issues such as fighting against corruption, over cooperation oriented to military section, sector. However, the fight against drug trafficking and the new military crisis will continue to be priorities. Both issues are on the US president's domestic political agenda. As we can see, the security agenda in the region is broad and range from basic issues related to the protection of people in the area of human security and also to what we call the heart agenda linked to the violence due to the operation of transnational organized crime. Our research is focused particularly in this issue. Transnational organized crime arms citizens, communities, states, and the international community. In many countries in Latin America region, the criminal organizations have become a national security threat. Unfortunately, Latin America leads the world rankings of social inequality and also of murders and intentional homicides, with an average rate of 21.5 deaths per each 100,000 people, more than three times the world average. Just think about the number of people that has been murdered in Mexico in the last 10 years. It is around 350,000 people. So in Latin America, we are facing a complex scenario, facing the challenges of transnational organized crime. Prohibition policies focus on the crop eradication Drug interdiction and the camping strategy have had limited, if not not results. Drugs productions and consumptions and consumption have now been reduced, and the social and economic cost of the strategy are very high. But even those results, the governments remain choosing the military options to face this challenge. Deepening the military participation in public safety, increasing military activities, even overlapping with civil duties, blurring the boundaries between national security and citizen security. As a result, we are facing the militarization of public safety, but also the policialization of armed forces. Our research analyze how this process has been happened and their impact on civil-military relations. We can explain the particular characteristics of the armed force involvement in non-conventional internal security tasks and even public security in Latin American 
countries taken in consideration four elements. First, the kind of threats that we are facing, specifically the characteristics of the transnational criminal organizations and the way in which they harm the security of the states and its societies. Second, the capabilities of civilian institutions. The weaker the civilian institutions are, the greater the need and also the justification for military involvement. The big problem is that the assumption that military way is temporary while we will build strength military institutions. But in a context of limited resources, the military answers as a reactive answers to the security crisis prevail and will prevail. Third, the political decisions of civilian governments to deploy armed forces in order to implement hard-handed security policies in the face of social complaints about insecurity. Just take a look to the Salvador under the current president. Fourth, social confidence in the armed forces is pretty high. According to Latin, Latino barometer figures, it's about 44% of Latin Americans, just behind the church. Well, the debate in Latin America is not just about the use of the armed forces to combat transnational threats, such as organized crime. The debate is about the way in which they are, they are used, the periods of time in which they are deployed, and of course, if they are supporting or replacing the civilian police forces. Also, we need to analyze these tendencies, focus our attention in its impacts in civil military relations. Now, let me share. Dr. Yadira, you are on time, please. Yeah. To speed up a little bit for, yes. for the sake of time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to keep the conclusions for the second round. It is okay for me in order to maintain the order to the time. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Yadira. So we'll be passing to our next panelist. And uh, just a minute, please. It will be Dr. Haruko Sato. She will be talking about the Diamond Princesses, International Cruise Ships, EHR, and Human Security. Dr. Haruko Sato is a specially appointed professor at the Osaka School of International Public Policy, OSIP, where she teaches Japan relations with Asia and identity international relations. She is also co-director of the OSIP, OSIP Yeah for Research Center, and she was previously part of the MEX Reinventing Japan Project on Peace and Human Security in Asia, PASA, with six South, South East Asian and four Japanese universities. In the past, she has worked at the Japan Institute of International Affairs, GIA, at Chatham House and Geico Forum. Her interests are primarily in state theory, Japanese nationalism and identity politics. Recent publications include China in Japan's national state identity, Japan's foreign relations in Asia, Japan's postmodern possibility with China, a view from Kansai, China, Japan relations in the 21st century, rethinking security in Japan in search of a post post war narrative, Japan's strategic challenges in a changing re regional environment, and through the looking glass, China's rise and scene from Japan. Also, she's published in post 311 Japan, a matter of restoring trust. Leg legitimacy defici deficient in Japan, the road to true popular sovereignty, and political legitimacy in Asia, new le leadership challenges. Japan re-engaging with China meaningfully, living with China, regional states, and China through crisis and turning points. And Professor Haruko Sato is a member of ea 4 Board of Directors, as well as a Chair of the Politics, Law, and International Relations Section of the International Academic Advisory Board. Please, Dr. Sato, if you want to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, to the, the Mexican um, Association of International Studies 
Um, I am also, I'm sorry, the, 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 the bio that uh, Amara read is a bit old, but I'm also uh, the executive uh, council member of the Asian International Studies and Political Association. So with my colleague Christian, who will be speaking later, uh, we will be the representing APISA. And um, I very much um, welcome this opportunity because um, I will be talking about the Diamond Princess, but I think the two previous talks that uh, we've heard from the, the both of our Mexican colleagues, I think uh, give a very nice um, uh, sort of a prelude to what I'm going to talk about because it's both about regionalism and also about uh, defining uh, what security issues we are facing right now. And this is, um, and as a start, I would like to sort of uh, introduce my talk by saying that um, this earlier this year, um, I was in charge of uh, conducting a, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, Commission study uh, on international cooperation on uh, preventing the spread of infectious diseases on cruise ships. Uh, this was a direct uh, uh, result of what Japan experienced with uh, the Diamond Princess, uh, which was the first case, uh, an outside of China cluster outbreak uh, of COVID-19 early in a February, 2020. And of course, the government, um, I can post the, I'll post the, the, the link to the, the final report that we concluded. It was a multi international study uh, conducted uh, primarily with International Academic Forum and also the university as the sort of the main uh, center, but also uh, with the cooperation from the, the um, Klingendal, which is the Dutch. International Affairs Institute, East West Center, Washington DC in the US, uh, and also with uh, UCL, the University College London, uh, the Australian Institute of International Affairs, and the National University of Singapore's Inter uh, Center of International Law. Basically, it was really about how do we sort of collect a picture of what was happening, ju not just with the Diamond Princess, which had over 3,000 passengers and crew, uh, but, and uh, had, uh, as I said, it was the major, the first major uh, cluster outbreak of COVID-19 outside of China. So it also became uh, a kind of a, a, a petri dish, with, as some people have called, a kind of a lab from, uh, uh, in order for other scientists from all over the world to examine the, the nature of the pathogen. So basically, how does COVID, uh, the, the coronavirus spread? How do you prevent it? So on and so forth. So it was very much a, a, a sort of an experiment. But what I want to talk to you today about is really not so much about the Diamond Princess and what happened on it, but rather using the Diamond Princess and other cruise ships as a lens to, to really highlight the fault lines of the international system, the, the group of international law uh, that were basically designed or at least were designed to, to respond to, to uh, pandemics. And the, the, the conclusion first is basically that none of these things were really designed to, to meet uh, the challenges of COVID-19 because the, the pathogen was ferocious, but also because all the international laws and international organizations, including the United Nations, were fragmented. And finally, to bring in the human security uh, angle is to really argue that all of these things were created with a state-centric point of view about security. And that, and therefore it was unable, not for the bad intentions or even for obfuscating facts and so on and so forth. Say for example, how we are accusing China right now for blocking information and so on. 
but rather because of the many legal gaps uh, and constraints that rather um, obstructed the efficacy with which any of these, particularly the frontline workers from the health workers, from in the Japanese case, also the self-defense forces that went into swab Diamond Princess, as well as the governments, local governments, all of these things came to be tested. And the reason why I say that it was because it's not for the bad intentions, it's because uh, we need uh, the, the say centric points of view is because this is the way the international system is designed. And I think this really is partly, um, and I will sort of later touch upon some of the conclusions that I think would be very, very important and significant for this particular setting, which is sort of Asia meeting Mexico, uh, because it also has something to do with a regional framework. So just to just so I'm just going to skim through uh, some of the points uh, that were really sort of identified and some and why I think through the study which we did with the foreign ministry we thought that one of the problems can be solved or at least enhanced cooperation can be sought if institutions and the United Nations, as well as states, policymakers took a human security perspective a little more seriously. Uh, because human security as a concept I know is uh, very much contested theoretically. Americans do not like using it in particular because uh, they tend to use words like counterinsurgency and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, I think it does human security as a concept because it does bring the level of threats uh, and the level of safety, uh, not defined by the state apparatus, but rather focuses on humans. So it brings down the sort of level of what is dangerous to all of us to a very sort of grounded grassroots level. Um, it looks the picture of what is threatening, such as the freedom from want, freedom from fear, all of these things look very differently. And it's much more easier to see how our security policy or security definitions uh, tend to be very narrow. So um, the first, a few facts, um, which I think might be important is that Diamond Princess, of course, was the first uh, in, major international cruise ship to be affected and to be exposed to this pathogen. Uh, but at the time, around February, um, there were about, and partly because of that, the Diamond Princess, about 40 to 50 international cruises that were stranded. They became their destination unknowns because uh, many ports refused to take them in. They were afraid of perhaps, you know, these ships carrying um, the, the, the new virus and everybody was shutting borders. You probably remember that very earlier on, uh, in spite of this international health regulations, which is a big uh, international law that covers international travel and health, uh, that travels to China became, uh, or from China, uh, became very, very troublesome. Everybody shut borders to China very, very quickly. And at least according to the IHR, um, that is not really, really supposed to happen. Uh, there is an article that says that the whole point of the IHR is to guarantee a safe travel, international travel, in spite of. So basically, everybody was supposed to be sort of having prepared for uh, epidemics, infectious diseases, and so on and so forth. But everybody just decided, well, we're just going to close borders. This, by some international law specialists, they argue, is it is very problematic because it does breach an agreement. Uh, and so one of the things that was very, very clear from the beginning is that with the, this pandemic, everybody, every state uh, rather acted 
selfishly. So this this really is uh, another problem. This the, the, the everybody acting selfishly is of course counter to the spirit of the United Nations. We're all supposed to be able to cooperate, but this thing, because of the unique nature of this pathogen, that everybody just decided we are going to focus on our national security, national interest. And this, um, of course, you cannot blame the, the, the governments for doing so, but at the same time, uh, if you think about the, the situation with, say, international refugees, uh, and uh, or the migrant crisis, it really it does boil down to people being left behind and people who are not covered by particular juris domestic jurisdictions. Uh, they don't have the protections. And particularly if you are in international waters, guess what? <laughs> it's basically the responsibility of either the operating company of the cruise ships or uh, the flag state. Now you and if if in, uh, in flag states, the people the so basically flag states means the ship sort of where the ship is registered as, and we all probably are very familiar with these sort of some flags of convenience, in order to reduce costs of uh, you know um, cargo shipping and so on and so forth, and even the operating company is American or Dutch, British or Japanese. Uh, you know, the ships could be registered to Panama or Libya and so on. Now, we think about the responsibility of the flag state, which is ultimately responsible for the health and safety of cruise ships. And in this case, um, this responsibility of the flag state became somewhat of another issue, which broke out be as a result because We'll talk about the, the flag state responsibility a bit, bit later, but at the same time, it was really about how much the flag state was willing to cooperate with the potential receiving port state. So you have, so we have two stakeholders to begin with, and then we have the coastal states, we have the labor supplying states, and this would be mostly in, in, the, in the Asian case, but in fact, mostly worldwide, the Indonesian uh, in, and Philippines. And then we have the operating companies who as uh, and cruise ship companies tend to be owned by very sort of maybe 10, 20 companies and they operate worldwide. And so everything was brought in and then also uh, the, the nature of the cruise ship itself is something that really is also unique. It's institutional in this sort of sociological sense. It's institutional because it's a community of people living under, you know, locked up in a certain rules and regulations. So it's a kind of a self-independent, think about uh, the Star Trek and Enterprise it's basically a sort of a, an independent uh, organization that is institutionalized. So there are rules and regulations where the captain uh, has the highest authority. And then we have a multinational uh, community because all the passengers come from all over the world. And on top of that, the crew also comes from all over the world. And in addition to this, we have another strange sort of colonial legacy of a cruise ship, because as I said, the, the labor supplying states come from mostly developing countries, serving rich, mostly Western, but sometimes perhaps rich, crazy rich Asians. Uh, and the point is, it is really the structure of the political economy, the structure of cruise ships is very colonial. Uh, so these things all came and just on the side of the crew, um, not just with the cruise ships, but with the entire shipping industry. Um, by the end of last year, so around December, there were over 
400,000 crew who could not be repatriated. They were stuck in the ship for months on end, partly because of borders were closed uh, and operating companies are the ones in charge of uh, the um, of what to do with crew not so much with the passengers it's really their home countries but with the crew it's really essentially up to the operating companies and if they're not willing to for example repatriate or test and whatever uh, a filipino stuck in uh, somewhere in the Atlantic, then they will be stuck there. And so these are all of these conditions that affect it. So with all these stakeholders, we have the, uh, the International Maritime Organization, International Labor Organization, as well as the WHO, all becoming party to what to do with outbreaks. Outbreaks contain, the, the do the testing, so which means you have to contain the outbreak, and then you have to treat the people, and then you also have to repatriate. So, uh, sorry, Dr. Sato, mm, we are on time. I'll, I'll be here. Ah, if you want to. Yes, I'll finish. I'll finish. I'll be here. So, so, I just wanted to highlight the point that the very conclusion that we had uh, after sort of outlining, examining all the stakeholders, in particular, is in relation to the European Union, EU had guidelines very earlier on because they had the regional framework to work with uh, these uh, outbreak of infectious diseases. So they had the, the European uh, Euro EU uh, Healthy Gateways, which already published guidelines in January, uh, early, uh, late January, to how to deal with COVID. Asia didn't have anything of this kind. Um, and, we, we were basically not only unable to coordinate amongst each other, but particularly the Japanese case, we really had to sort of negotiate and find out who was responsible for paying these things, who was going to repatriate, who's going to test, so on and so forth. But in the, sh the short run, because a lot of these things also happened uh, around the Pacific, one of the recommendations that we gave was to have a regional, so a pan-Pacific, framework in which we are able to have the same standards, unambiguous understanding of these international laws and implementations and programs to help ports, so port states, to have the facilities uh, that would be able to receive these sh ships without turning them away. So the Diamond Princess was not turned away, but as I said, there were 40, 50 ships that were turned away. In some cases, in the Panama Canal, they were uh, some, you know, they were not allowed to to go through. The, and passengers died on the ship. And so these, I think, this is a. And so the point I just wanted to make is that we really need to come up with a different way of defining these international laws and including non-state actors as signatories to these uh, uh, international laws and agreements. Otherwise, we will always be stuck with a very state-centric uh, way of doing things where people will be left behind and fall out of being treated. So sorry about this, but anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sato. Next will be Christian Schaffner, and he will be talking about Taiwan's foreign policy initiatives during the pandemic. Christian is an associate professor at the Department of International Trade Overseas China Chinese University in Taiwan. He has served as president of the Asian Political and International Studies Association, APISA, uh, president of the Austrian Association of East Asian Studies, and founded editor-in-chief of the Journal of Contemporary Eastern Asia. His research interests uh, embrace political and economic studies with special reference to East Asian societies. Current research projects deal with Taiwan's foreign policy initiatives and the impact of social media on electoral campaigns and democratization in Asia. Uh, Professor, are you ready?
Hello, so, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, Professor, thank you. Okay, good, then we start. So my presentation today analyzes uh, Taiwan's foreign policy initiatives uh, during the pandemic. More specifically, I would like, I don't know why, oh, wait a moment, I can't, the PowerPoint doesn't move. There's, oh, now it works, okay, good. Yes. Good, so uh, specifically, and more specifically, I would like to look at how effective Taiwan's foreign policies have been in terms of contributing to the global fight against COVID, uh, regional stability, as well as Taiwan's global image and diplomatic leverage. Okay. So uh, the COVID pandemic has had dramatic social, economic and political consequences. It has led to the death of millions of people, brought about despair and poverty, disrupted supply chains and slowed down global economic growth. It also exposed fundamental weaknesses in public health and systems and intergovernmental cooperation. However, uh, there also have been states that utilize the pandemic as a vehicle for nation branding and public diplomacy initiatives. Vietnam, uh, New Zealand, South Korea, China, and of course, Taiwan may be listed here as examples. Apart from highlighting the success of their zero case policy, states engaged in medical diplomacy. China certainly is the most prominent case here first being accused of being the very source of the devastating outbreak and blamed for the global spread of the virus, it then began to polish up its global image by a series of concerted diplomatic efforts, including the distribution of medical supplies and vaccines. Other states such as Vietnam, South Korea, and New Zealand have spent comparatively less energy on utilizing the pandemic for nation branding activities. Being a contested state, Taiwan, on the other hand, has been compelled to exploit the pandemic more vigorously. Its recent public diplomacy and nation branding efforts must be seen in the context of defending sovereignty against Chinese irritantism. That is, these policies must be seen as being part of a long-term attempt to counter Chinese territorial claims by replacing historical stories about the renegade Chinese province with a different narrative. A narrative highlighting Taiwan's peacefulness, democratic aspirations and willingness to contribute uh, to the welfare of other nations. As such, Taiwan's foreign policy initiatives during the pandemic must be seen in the light of national security. Domestically, the government has to demonstrate its ability to cope with the pandemic effectively without neglecting its highly praised commitment to democratic procedures and norms. On the international stage, it has to sell its domestic success while offering assistance to other states and utilizing the ongoing global changes in a beneficial way. It is against this backdrop that I will investigate Taiwan's foreign policy initiatives during the pandemic in this presentation. Foreign policy initiatives here comprise specific humanitarian initiatives as well as efforts to attract the attention of foreign audiences by highlighting the effectiveness of government's COVID policies and the negative implication of Chinese attempts to prevent cooperation between Taiwan and other states. As to the latter, during the early stages of the pandemic, there was substantial reporting on Taiwan's handling of the pandemic. Reports highlighted the fact that Taiwan, with a population of over 23 million people, effectively curbed the spread of the virus by acknowledging the importance of travel restrictions, facial masks, and contact tracing. More importantly, international media outlets have not only covered Taiwan's successful way of coping with the virus, but also highlighted Taiwan's geopolitical importance and capability of undercutting China's effort to use the crisis to tout the strength of its authoritarian system. As to humanitarian assistance, 
The government reportedly supported frontline medical personnel in over 80 countries under bilateral and multilateral frameworks. These initiatives were marketized globally through social media to narrate Taiwan's solidarity with the international community. Under the hashtags Taiwan can help and Taiwan is helping, users reflected on the efforts of the Taiwanese government. Both hashtags have been an essential part of the official nation branding campaign. In April 2020, for example, the government placed a full page advertisement in the New York Times. You can see this advertisement here on the right side. So that's the advertisement that was placed in the New York Times. So the advertisement in the New York Times are featuring the hashtags while posing the question, who can help? With the who in the question being capitalized and Taiwan being presented as the answer, the advertisement points out Taiwan's expectations from as well as contributions to the international community. That is, it raises the issue of Taiwan being helpful in times of global health crisis, while at the same time expressing its expectations of being part of transnational organizations such as the World Health Organization. The ad appeared in the New York Times on the same day the United States suspended contributions to the World Health Organization. Perhaps a coincidence, but Taiwan's public diplomacy efforts certainly caught the attention of policymakers. Donald Trump, for example, mentioned Taiwan twice in his angry letter to the Director General of the World Health Organization in May 2020. More specifically, Trump accused the World Health Organization of downplaying the dangers of the virus despite earlier warnings of the Taiwanese government and expressed support for Taiwan's criticism of the World Health Organization's dealing with the pandemic. Taiwan has successfully capitalized on the growing differences between China and the United States by initiating several cooperation projects with US institutions. As a result, in August 2000, US House Secretary Alex Azar visited Taiwan to strengthen cooperation with Taiwan and more importantly, to support Taiwan's international role in fighting the pandemic. The visit itself was of geopolitical importance since Azar was the highest level US official to arrive in Taiwan in four decades. Moreover, public support for Taiwan was also shown by key officials at the White House during press conferences. Press Secretary Kelly McCann, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien and Senior Advisor Jared Kushner were all spotted wearing global masks with the label Made in Taiwan clearly visible on the lower left corner. Overall, politicians, business leaders, and celebrities in Europe and America, including Bill Gates and Barbara Streisand, have publicly praised the Taiwan Can Help campaign, which included a donation of over 50 million face, facial masks and other medical equipment to those in need. Apart from that, the pandemic has also highlighted the fragility of the global supply chain and the geopolitical importance of Taiwan. In foreign affairs, none other than President Tsai Ing-wen herself draw attention to the fact that the pandemic has fueled a contest of ideologies with Taiwan lying at the intersection of contending systems. Moreover, she emphasized that Taiwan's semiconductor industry is especially significant for global stability, since it constitutes a silicon shield that allows Taiwan to protect itself and others from aggressive attempts of by authoritarian regimes to disrupt global supply chains. We also have domestic implications here. Taiwan, like other contested states in recent history, relies on claims to democracy to obtain legitimacy and international recognition. As such, the government has had to demonstrate its capability in terms of effectively coping the pandemic without neglecting its commitment to democratic procedures and norms. 
The latter matters more when it comes to support from other countries, from other democracies in particular, whereas the former is a necessary precondition to obtain domestic legitimacy and to keep China at bay. That is a complete breakdown of public health system, subsequent chaos and unrest would have justified a military intervention according to the domestic laws of China. Taiwan has therefore been compelled to deal with the crisis effectively while following democratic principles. But how much has the government cared about these principles? Despite the government's stringent zero case policy, the government pursued information transparency by holding daily press conferences to inform the public about the current pandemic situation and government actions. The government noticed that the worst thing to do was to have a black box and uninformed people. Providing information has thus been one of the key principles. Moreover, privacy rights have been a further key concern in the implementation of contact tracing and other measures. The public in general supported the government initiatives, mostly because they reflected the public will. More importantly here is the fact that the public will spoke out that the public will spoke out in favor of solving the crisis democratically rather than following the authoritarian way adopted by other governments in the region. For example, Yang and Tsai show in their paper that during the pandemic, the increasing concern for public safety has coincided with the rising support for democratic values. More specifically, most of the respondents supported public safety measures but also felt that messages just as releasing individual information of infected people may only stigmatize infected people and may thus not be conducive to public safety, a view also shared by the government. Conclusion, this leads us to our conclusions here. So first, we may conclude that foreign as well as domestic initiatives during the pandemic have foremost been the result of national security concerns. Second, notwithstanding, they have had a positive effect on the well being of the people residing in Taiwan as well as in the recipient countries. Third, Moreover, the initiatives have helped to broaden global support for the island republic and to increase Taiwan's diplomatic leverage. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. You're also very much on time. So if you are okay and everyone on the panel is okay with it, I will be uh, letting Dr. Jadira Galvez to finish her presentation, the conclusions and present it to us. And after that, we can have some conclusions from the panelists or maybe some questions from the public. Dr. Jadira, please. Thank you very much, Mara. I'm gonna take a few minutes in order to make my conclusions. Um, well, um, there is a clear tendency to deepening the military participations in internal issues in Latin America. The risk is clear. It is important to avoid the transit from a situation of exceptionality of the use of armed forces in internal security to something to, in order to normalize or to do these kind of issues permanent. And deepening and broadening military involvement in public security tasks carries serious risks. It militarizes responses to issues that require holistic visions, holistic response. It may limit the development of civilian institutions and, may, and it may expand military prerogatives. Also, it may put military institutions themselves at risk. Therefore, we can identify the following challenge for democratic governance and institutional design in Latin America. First, 
the development and strengthening of civil institutions, police, and also criminal justice, capable of facing the challenge of organized crime in our region. Second, a clear definition of the limits of use armed forces to ensure that the balance of democratic civil military relations are safe. Third, the guarantee democratic freedom and fundamental rights with the fight against organized crime about the dilemma between security and freedom. And fourth, the development of a new schemes of sub-regional and regional cooperation in confronting these threats, where the military may also have a key role to combating transnational threats. That is why it's so important to establish temporary limits to the use of armed forces in these tax, including the development of the legal frameworks and protocols of use of force. Thank you very much for your attention, and we are ready for the questions. Thank you, Mara, for your kind attention. Thank you, doctor. If everyone, um, anyone on the panel has a question, if you want to open your microphone, or if not, uh, we can also- I, I, have, I have one question. Thank you, uh, Professor, please go ahead. I have one question to the last presenter uh, on the armed forces. Uh, well, I, I wonder whether there has been a discussion uh, in Latin America about demilitarizing the armed forces. What I mean is that, okay, you, I understand that you use the military because it already has the infrastructure to deal with it, to deal with crisis. But the thing is, why is, it, is there no discussion about splitting the military armed forces so that you use the structure and you have a civil uh, department, so to say, and you have a real military department. So that would be of interest uh, into this uh, for me uh, regarding this paper then um, for Haruko yeah, I understand that you explained the reasons uh, why this happens uh, with those ships but I wonder is there any conclusion whether there was actually or there is actually some laws saying that in this case this country would have been completely responsible for it. You mentioned that it has been split because there are many, many nationalities. So is this the conclusion that there is no clear definition so far? Then the second is you mentioned the European Union, but I, I don't know the details, but I wonder if this happened in the European Union, would there be a clear solution to the problem or not? Thank you very much. Who should go first? Um, uh, if you want, maybe to data first and after Dr. Sato. Maybe the, the last question about the European Union, I think uh, Dr. Chen okay. will answer. Okay, all right. Um, okay. Um, was there any country? Uh, so this is the problem with the, the what we found out uh, with uh, through our research was that yes, um, there wasn't really a clear-cut definition uh, to, the, to the extent that now they 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 are discussing at some um, at some level about a pandemic treaty because the the IHR at the time, even though it was revised, they had a revision process from 1995 to 1905, taking into account of the SARS. Um, pandemic, um, it really still wasn't enough to, to actually clearly identify whose responsibility in this case was, uh, was going to be heavier, whether it's the flag state or the companies. Um, and, the, and it really does boil down, I'm sorry, it's a bit sort of abstract and conceptual, but um, it was about navigating and negotiating sovereign rights of all the states. Because at the end, all of these international laws are made to respect and also to expect the sovereign states to be prepared. And um, in fact, from 2005, um, the, the, the revision of IHR in 2005 actually did state that all the states needed to be prepared for 
uh, infectious disease outbreaks in ports, in, in ports, not just like airports, but in you know, seaports. Uh, but it turns out that only uh, about a less than a half, I think, of the countries uh, since then have actually done anything to improve, say, you know, testing capacities, quarantine capacities, and so on and so forth. The best case that did anything to do with was, was the Netherlands. Um, they left uh, Rotterdam open. Uh, they allowed transition of crew. They allowed change all of these things, partly because the, the airport is very close by, but they were also very much um, involved in shipping, as you know. So it's a big flag state as well as a big port state. So they were basically diplomatically as a matter of policy concern, priority to promote itself as, as a reliable uh, port of confidence as well as a sort of a flag, uh, flag of confidence state. Um, and in terms of the European Union, yes, actually, had this happened in the European Union at the same time, um, I would imagine that the cases uh, would have been lower, uh, partly because um, it was very touch and go, by the way. The, the European Union health, uh, Healthy Gateways guide, Guidelines about dealing with the pandemic was published in January 27th. Um, and that was like the most comprehensive guidelines that, they, that the world had actually by that, at that point. Japan's the Diamond Princess occurred on 5th, I think, 5th of February. The case being reported uh, from Hong Kong, uh, it was a passenger who, who sort of had left after a cruise, he disembarked, and then five days later, he tested positive. So the notice came to the Diamond Princess that there, were, there might be an infection. But this also was problematic because the captain didn't really do anything uh, up to a point until it docked in Yokohama to, to prevent, uh, say, social distancing and so on, because all of these things were, at the time, quite new. The, so Diamond Princess happened partly because of the timing but also because um, of a lack of at least uh, clear guidelines for both the operating companies as well as the port states to follow. So my guess is that if Diamond Princess docked in Rotterdam earlier, if they did, um, it wouldn't have been uh, as bad as it turned out to be. That's my, does that answer the question? Question. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Talita, if you want to answer the question as well, and we also, uh, before you answer, there's another question. Maybe uh, there's no direct direction to to whom the question is directed to, but it's from Marco Lopategui, and he says. Good evening, great panel, greetings to all. I would like to ask if in this new definition of threats in the fourth industrial revolution and all the challenges faced in the cyber space, we could say that there are new trends that are pushing forward uh, in North America to create a new security community in the terms of Busan and strengthen the bonds and go deeper in the integration process due to the complexity of those threats and their characteristics that make vulnerable the critical infrastructure of the region, the population in terms of trafficking in persons and all the variety of organized crime networks and now the COVID-19. To mention a few examples, um, maybe Dr. Jadira, you can answer that too as well or anyone in the panel. Thank you. Sorry, your microphone is up. have some problems with my microphone, I think. That is okay? We can hear you, thank uh, you. Regarding the first question, I, I think that the problem is not uh, the use of military in some domestic use, issues, supporting civilian authorities, because it is a tool of the state in order to contrarrest and combat 
transnational threats. As uh, Professor Pion Berlin has pointed out, nowadays it happens because the civilian governments ask the military to participate in that missions. And it's not necessarily will finish in the political participation of military or the strength of the, uh, these institutions. But the problem is when we use or we tend to use the military for everything, like a fire, like a fire bombers. Uh, in the case of criminal violence, we cannot resolve the, deep, the deepest problems regarding to the state fragility just using the military. For example, the rule of law areas, police, criminal justice. I think that is the problem in Latin America because we are expanding constantly, deeply, the military participation in this kind of issues that not necessarily have to this have have to be resolved with this kind of participation and that is why we need to think about a more complex and comprehensive policies about uh, security national security and also human security because the problem in latin america is regarding uh, as much as human security issues uh, with the violence, especially if we think about the uh, young people involved in criminal organizations. We need to, to, to develop um, some responses that can, um, how do you say, um, we can combine the rule of law and the use of force but also with policies regarding to prevention the violence and also to understand the deepest kind of organizations. Because the organized crime is moving faster and the state is beyond and the responses are so, 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 so slow in front of all the challenges of security in Latin America. And regarding with the um, um, Marco Lopategui question, I think that uh, the um, USMCA provides legal framework to build a cybersecurity complex in North America because it depicts the intentions of each country in the regions to start working on it. Moreover, similar national attempts have been seen in all Mexico, Canada, and United States. But we have to think this kind of security complex also in the face of each country national interest. Commitment between the three parts is imperative on the matter. And for that, the next four years are crucial. The agenda for the future must hold strong bonds amongst neighbors. And we don't really know what is going to happen because this uh, cybersecurity agenda also is broad and it's so complex. Thank you very much for your questions, professors. Thank you, Mara. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have any final words. I would yeah. like only to add to, to what uh, Dr. Agaves uh, answered to Maestro Lopategui, that security in, in, in a multidimensional vision, as well, including, of course, human security, may have to, to, to be the main narrative that we have to fight for in, in all fora. I, what I mean is, it is a world debate it was mentioned that maybe the Americans do, do, do not uh, do not like uh, human security as a concept uh, that much. However, it seems to me that we have to face uh, beyond the pandemic that the, 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 the horizons of security in the world goes beyond the traditional vision. Therefore, in North America, we have to go against that narrative that national security is only a question of the state, but rather it's a question of the people 
the the human security of of, of the of the persons. Therefore, I think that a, a community is possible if we share values, perceptions, and of course strategies. is is not a matter of, of who imposes the narrative, but rather how we debate it and go deeper. And I believe there are the grounds to have a new face of the security in all over the world, in all regions. That is my response. Thank you for the question, Maestro Lopati. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for your time. And we are already over time, but I thank everyone for being here today. Uh, some joining from other parts of the world. And I very much appreciate the, the the time and the effort that you had for today's panel. And it was very interested and interesting, and I think everyone agrees with it. I would like to close this panel and thank everyone for being here today. Uh, any other further questions, you can contact the professors and please uh, join the, the links that our partners from AME has given to us for registration and for knowing a little bit more about what, what we have. Thank you everyone for being here today. <laughs>